Hello. Good evening, everybody. It's five o'clock. Well, just about five o'clock. Uh, it's Monday, 1st of June. Uh, today is, uh, for me, it's the 50th one of these videos I've done. Uh, not including the sort of blah, blah, this is something I think I'm going to do videos that I did at the start. And I'm hoping that it, it's going to um, come out okay, because my six-year-old dropped my phone today and has shattered the corner of the screen, which was already slightly cracked, but it's now properly shattered. I don't think it affects the camera, um, but I'm not completely certain. Uh, oh, wait a minute, that's something I forgot to do. I forgot to turn my phone into keeping things quiet. Um, hang on a minute. Let's just have a look at that. Uh, screen. Hello. Sorry about that. Right. Here we are. The Demon and the Embers. We're on to book four. So yeah, the 50th video I've done. Um, and yeah, we're on to book four. The Demon and the Embers. Usual problem. Uh, mirror image. Sorry about that. There's nothing I can do about it. I don't know. I find myself wondering how other people manage to take videos the other way around. But I wonder if they do it... I can't do it with the rear-facing camera because I can't see what it's doing. I wonder if they do it on their laptops. Maybe they do. I did try this on my laptop originally and it just wasn't very good. So uh, I don't do that anymore. Um, right, chapter one of The Demon in the Embers. Chapter one. Joe followed the tour party across the gravel. Ahead of them, the guide stopped. When people think of the Tower of London, the guide said, they think of torture and execution. But in fact, it was a palace and a fortress. Quietly, Joe unsipped the pocket of his shorts and slipped his hand in. He felt a flutter of panic. What if his St Christopher had fallen out? It was risky bringing it to London, but if he wanted to slip through time, he had to have it with him. And he couldn't wear it around his neck because then he couldn't drop it. But it was still there, safely in his pocket. Joe's pulse settled. He wound his fingers through the chain. In fact, the tower wasn't going to be a very good place to drop it, he'd realised, after he and Mum had bought their tickets and come in. If he did manage to slip through time here, he'd have terrible trouble getting out. Very few people were actually executed at the tower, the guide was saying. The most famous is probably Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII, who was beheaded on the spot where we're now standing. Wife number five, Catherine Howard, was also executed here, and so was another queen a few years later, Lady Jane Grey. She was only sixteen. This is a jolly day out, Mum murmured in Joe's ear. He glanced round. She was smiling. It was a jolly day out, just the two of them, doing something together other than being shuffled around hospital departments while the doctors failed to find anything wrong with Joe. There wasn't anything wrong, of course. It was just that his body was struggling more and more to adjust each time he slipped in and out of Lucy's worlds. It had been a couple of months now since he last saw Lucy at Old Wardle Castle, so naturally he hadn't had any more episodes. But it would happen again, he was certain. He knew it would make his life easier if there was nobody there to watch, but to get into Lucy's next world he had to be in the right place in his own one. So far, that had always meant being where other people were. Even so, this really was the wrong place. The other famous executions took place on Tower Hill, the guide went on. Thomas More, Thomas Cromwell, and so on. Of course, it was big business in its day, executing people. Huge crowds came to watch, not unlike Wimbledon, maybe, Although Andy Murray should still have his head on his shoulders when he comes off court this afternoon, even if he loses his match. Around Joe, some of the other tourists in the group chuckled. Joe bit his lip. He'd always watched the tennis with Dad. But last summer, Wimbledon had been on in the background while Dad packed his things and moved out. Joe hadn't watched any of it this year. He felt Mum squeeze his shoulder, as though she knew what he was thinking. It had been her suggestion that they come up to London and do some sightseeing to make the most of Joe's brother Sam being away at scout camp. 
The tower was also home to the royal menagerie for over 600 years, the guide continued. It started with King John, who kept lions and bears here. His son, Henry III, was given a wedding gift of three lions, or three leopards, we're not sure which. And later on, James I had a platform built so that he could watch his lions fighting the other animals. Horrible man, Mum whispered. It would have served him right if Guy Fawkes had blown him up. But Joe wasn't really listening. He was thinking about the leopard which had been given to Lucy's family when he met her at Fishbourne Roman Palace. After what had happened there, he could see how keeping such dangerous animals might cause problems. What happened to the Royal Menagerie? someone asked. Why isn't it still here? The guide raised an eyebrow. Space, he said. The animals apparently found it cramped. There were quite a few escapes and several attacks. In the 1830s, they were moved to Regent's Park to what's now a London Zoo. Would you like to go to the zoo this afternoon? Mum asked Joe when they were standing outside the tower a while later. Joe thought about it. It seemed a bit of a wasted opportunity when they could equally well go to Marwell or Bristol. What he really wanted was to find the right place to drop his St Christopher, to try and see Lucy again. Almost anywhere around London might work as long as his feet were touching the ground. It had worked like that in York, after all. Of course, he had no idea whether Lucy had actually lived in London at any time, but there was only one way to find out. Let's have lunch first and decide after that, he said. We could go to one of those cafes over there. As they walked along the road towards them, he unzipped his pocket again and held the St Christopher in his hand. He wondered if he could drop it without Mum noticing. It wouldn't be easy. The pavement wasn't that crowded, and the traffic was streaming past. If the St Christopher rolled into the road, he might never get it back. Then he had an idea. If he pretended to retie his shoelace, he could press the St Christopher to the ground without letting go of it. He wouldn't be able to do that more than twice without Mum getting suspicious, but it was better than nothing. Before she could turn around, he stooped down and let the pendant of the St Christopher touch the pavement. A taxi whizzed past, but the hissing in Joe's ears grew louder as the taxi got further away. He held his breath. The hissing grew and grew. His heart began to pound. He'd done it. It had worked. His skin tingled with excitement and alarm. There was no going back now. The world swung round. His fingers were still moving, pretending to fiddle with his laces, but his trainers were gone. He blinked and waited for the dizziness to pass. Thank goodness it wasn't so bad going this way from his world into Lucy's. As the spinning stopped, the shoes he was now wearing came into focus. They were made of dull black leather, clumsily cut, and they came to square points at the front. Woollen stockings stretched up to his knees, and above them was something like a pair of baggy shorts. They were brownish-green, made of thick, scratchy material, quite unlike the shorts he'd been wearing in his own world. These might be breeches, he thought. He would have to find out later. At once he felt the familiar stab of alarm at the thought of everything he wouldn't know here. This was exactly what he'd been trying to do, slip back into the past... But why did he put himself through it? He straightened up and steadied himself against the building next to him, keeping his hand tightly closed around his St Christopher. The street was crowded and very narrow, with no pavements. It was gloomy, too, because the buildings jutted out overhead from both sides, the upper stories almost touching in the middle in some places, blocking out all but a strip of smoky blue sky. The air rang with bewildering noise. Hooves clattered and wheels ground against the cobbles as a cart rumbled past. Bells clanged, signs hanging from buildings squeaked, and there was the piercing, clacking noise of something like a football rattle. From the house behind Joe came the wailing of a small child and the sound of a violin drifted out of another window. A shout right in front of Joe made him jump. 
It was a man pushing a barrow of what looked like sacks of coal. Around him, people pushed past in both directions, women with trays of strawberries and raspberries, boys carrying packages, two gentlemen on horseback. Joe stared as a woman leading a donkey stopped at a house to milk the animal. A pair of ragged boys dawdled by. A dog darted beneath a cart, yelping as it got kicked. A man rolled a barrel along, calling out something that sounded like sand. Was that what all the shouting meant? Joe wondered. Traders advertising their wares? What about the old man, then, who was almost singing but wasn't carrying anything? Joe watched, baffled, as the door of a house opened. A woman came out with a bundle of mat knives. The man took a whetstone from his pocket and began to sharpen them. Joe jumped a second time as the clash of a hammer on an anvil started up very nearby. He couldn't see a blacksmith anywhere. It must be in the yard next to one of these buildings. Workshops, shops and houses seemed to be all mixed up together, just like they had been in Jorvik. There was a terrible stink of smoke, rubbish and sewage too, very much like Jorvik. But there was also a bitter metallic smell and something acrid burning. Joe tried to remember whether he'd ever got used to the stink of the Viking Age. He didn't think so. It was one of the things that made the past feel really hostile. He was uncomfortably hot, he realised. It was much warmer here than it had been at home. He put his hand to his collar to loosen it. Where he'd been wearing a t-shirt before, he now had a jacket made of the same thick material as the shorts, buttoned all the way up to his chin. No wonder he was stifling. The sleeves stopped just below his elbows, and a shirt stuck out over his forearms, finishing in long, grubby frills at his wrists. The same shirt was billowing out around his waist, between the jacket and shorts. Joe thought of Mum's daily reminders to tuck himself in before he went to school. She would have a fit at this. At the collar of the jacket hung two white strips of material, also slightly dirty looking. He fastened his St. Christopher around his neck and tucked it down inside his shirt. He would have to stay there until he could give it to Lucy, assuming he found her. Now came another yell, this time from a carter cracking his whip, driving his horse through the crowds. Joe leapt back. The metal rims of the wheels grated past just centimetres from his toes. The driver carried on bawling abuse at the people in his way. A woman with a basket of fish on her head screeched back, and a man on horseback shook his fist, but the carter just cracked his whip again. Flies covered the steaming heap of dung the horse had left behind. Joe set off up the street, looking at the houses as he went. The walls were mostly made with wooden beams, filled in with white or mustard-coloured plaster. Dad had told Joe once that this style was built by the Tudors, so perhaps he was in Tudor times again. If Lucy's family had moved from Old Wardour to London, he might be in the same world as last time, just a few months later. The clothes were different, it was true, but that might just be London fashions, he thought hopefully, though he hadn't seen anyone wearing hats like here. There seemed to be one on his own head as well, its wide brim curled up slightly on one side. It would be good for keeping the sun off, he supposed, since there wouldn't be any sunglasses. Of course, if the streets were all as narrow and overhung as this one, you wouldn't ever see the sun anyway. The thought depressed him. This was starting to feel like a very bad idea. He forced his attention back to the street. This probably wasn't going to be Tudor times, he guessed. These buildings could have been here a hundred years or more. In fact, some of them looked a bit like they'd grown here, popping up in the tiniest gaps. A lot of houses were three or even four storeys high, each part level piled higgledy-piggledy on top of the last, so that they looked as though they might fall over at any moment. And they were all wood and plaster. He couldn't see a single one made of brick or stone. Suddenly... He was grabbed from behind. Got one, yelled a man's voice just above Joe's ear. 
Joe's head jangled. The man shifted his grip, pinning Joe's arms to his sides. Joe looked over his shoulder. A second man had emerged from the crowd. He was unshaven and heavy. Too small, he declared, and too young, I reckon. The first man spun Joe round, making sure he didn't let go. He looked Joe up and down. Healthy, though. I say we take him for the quota. If we get our twenty, he can be a bonus. And if we don't, at least we can count him in. I mean, we haven't exactly had much luck this morning, have we? Joe squirmed between the man's hands. They were rough, with dirt ingrained in the skin. The man tightened his hold. People were still going past, but nobody paid the slightest attention. What'll we do with him? asked the second man, still dubious. Take him down to Bridewell to be locked up with the rest? Quicker to take him straight to the ship, said the first, jerking his head towards a side street. It's only a stone's throw. They can set him to work right away. Then he won't count as one of ours, objected the second man. Don't worry about that, I'll make sure he does. The first man swung Joe round to face away from him again and gave him a shove. Joe stumbled forward, trying frantically to think what to do. He hadn't yet got his bearings in this new world, but if he didn't try and escape from these men right now, he'd soon be doing something he'd much rather not. He sank his teeth into the hand of the man holding him, the man yelled and loosened his grip. Taking his chance, Joe wrenched one arm free, twisted round and punched the man in the groin. The man roared. But as Joe scrambled away from him, he slipped on the cobbles. At once, the second man leapt on him. An enormous fist hovered above Joe's face. Joe winced. He'd only just got here. He might not be quite sure that he liked it but he didn't want to be pulled back into his own time just yet. If he wasn't, though, he'd be beaten to a pulp. Stop! shouted another voice. What on earth do you think you're doing? The man on top of Joe paused. What's it to you if I beat my own errand boy? He glowered. A man was striding towards them. His jacket flapped at his thighs and ringlets of long black hair bounced on his shoulders beneath an extravagant hat. He's not your errand boy, is he? He snapped. I recognise you and your friend. I've seen you a few times in the last week, pressing men for the ships. If our hopes of victory rest on boys as young as this one, the Dutch will have an easy time of it. Joe turned his head. The man who'd grabbed him in the first place was now backing away. Let him go, commanded the man with the ringlets. Go and find someone who's at least big enough to put up a fight. Resentfully, the second man lumbered to his feet and stomped off. Joe let out a gasp. His rescuer bent down and offered his hand. Bad luck, young fellow, he said. They must be getting desperate if they'll take a boy like you. What for? Joe panted. What were they going to do with me? They're seizing men to press. Joe dusted himself down, wondering what on earth this meant. The man must have realised he didn't understand, because he explained. They'd have dragged you off to the quay and put you on a ship to go to war. War? Joe's eyes widened. He didn't dare ask which war. Allow me to escort you home, the man said. I don't want you to come to any more harm. Joe pulled his hat straight. I'm afraid I don't live here, sir, he said reluctantly. There were going to be enough lies that he would have to tell without adding unnecessary ones. In fact, I've only just arrived. Come to London to seek your fortune, like my fellow Mercer Whittington, the man asked wryly. Whittington? Joe repeated. You must know the ballad. Joe hesitated. Was he talking about Dick Whittington? Had Dick Whittington been real then? And in that case, what was a mercer? In the fairy tale, he'd been Lord Mayor, hadn't he? But that wasn't the same thing, Joe was sure. 
Or had he blundered into some kind of fairy tale world? It certainly didn't feel like it. Or are you escaping something? The man asked. You're alone, I presume? Joan nodded. No parents? No. What is it then, boy? We hear the plague still rages in the east of the country. Is that it? Have you fled the contagion and didn't want to say in case I send you packing? Joe paused for a moment, then nodded again. If he was going to be given an explanation for why he was here, it would be foolish not to take it, even if he didn't quite understand. Your parents are dead? Poor boy, the man said, taking Joe's reticence as agreement. My wife and I lost four of our children last year, and a baby too. Not a month old. It's brought misery beyond imagining. Joe was silent. He didn't deserve this man's sympathy, but it was too late to tell him the truth now. Why don't you come home with me? I'm on my way back for my dinner. You can eat with us and rest a while. In fact, you can stay a few days if you wish. My wife and daughter will look after you. I have a son too, not much older than you, I'd guess. How old are you? Eleven, sir. Joe replied. Peter is thirteen, so you might have things in common. Joe looked up, sharply. Peter had been the name of Lucy's brother. He should be thirteen now, or thereabouts. Joe peered at the man's face beneath the curls and the plumed hat. Was this Lucy's father? He'd barely seen him at Old Wardour, and with the long dark hair and these clothes, he looked completely different from how he'd looked in Yorvik. "'What's your name, boy?' the man asked. "'Joseph Hopkins, sir, though everyone calls me Joe.' "'Very good, Joe,' the man swept his hat from his head and bowed. "'I'm glad to be of service. Now, come with me.' That's the end of the chapter. It's a bit of a dilemma, isn't it? Do you go with the stranger and hope they're not a stranger? Or do you reject the help they offer you uh, and then strike out on your own? And you've no way of telling which is the right decision. That's the problem Joe's got. Anyway, we'll find out tomorrow whether he makes the right decision. That's it for now. I'll see you tomorrow.